Well, here's the thesis, and this is where there would probably be a theological uh, skirmish over this one. But I believe that Jesus Christ in his death covered original sin. That the thing that the death of Christ did was cover and overrule original sin. So that no man is condemned because they're born in Adam. But men are condemned because they consciously reject salvation. Are people born with what Pelagius called tabula rasa, meaning a blank slate? Or are people born with what theologians call original sin? Join us today as we take this time to stop and think about it. Hello? Hello, anybody home? I don't think, McFly, I think. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. What were you thinking? I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Don't say anything now. Just think about it. You're listening to Stop and Think About It, a podcast for the Christian thinker. In a day when sound biblical preaching has been replaced by man-centered entertainment and the church has become increasingly anti-intellectual, this podcast will encourage believers to think biblically and theologically. So please join me as we get ready to stop and think about it. Greetings, friends and foes, saints and sinners. Today, we have the Stop and Think About It crew with us once again. We have Glenn, the West Indian wordsmith. Steve, the Brooklyn Berean. We also have Nick, the Puerto Rican Puritan. And I'm your host, Phil, also known as the Sensei. And today, we are continuing our series, Ancient Heresies and Modern Clothes. Last episode, we covered Sabellianism, the Great Pretender. And today, we're focusing on Pelagianism. The self-help gospel. Steve, in our intro, we just heard Tony Evans state, but the thing that the death of Christ did was cover and overrule original sin so that no man is condemned because they are born in Adam. But men are condemned because they consciously reject salvation. What is wrong with that? And just to be clear here, all right, we're not throwing Tony Evans under a heresy bus. He's an orthodox brother in Christ, but he's absolutely dead wrong here. And here's why. He contradicts what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22. Listen. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. By a man came death. What man? I would say that man is Adam because he states in Adam all die and death is the penalty for sin. So if Jesus washed away original sin, then what Tony Evans is saying is that we are born tabula rasa with a blank slate, which sounds a lot like Pelagianism and even Islam. And yet Paul wrote in Romans 5 in verses 12 and 18 the following. Listen to verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And in verse 18, he says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness led to justification and life for all men. So what does Paul mean by saying all men? Well, in Romans 5, Paul is contrasting two classes of people, those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ. So Tony Evans said no man is condemned because they're born in Adam. Yet Paul says the exact opposite. So, I mean, who are we to believe? I think I'm going to go with Paul here. I'm with Paul. Yeah. And you can't forget John 3:36 which says this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but listen, the wrath of God remains on him. And so what is he getting at when he says the wrath of God remains on him? Well, that's a good question. So in order for something to remain on you, it had to be there previously. True. So in the case of those who reject the gospel, did the wrath of God come upon them when they rejected the gospel, or was it already there? John says it was already there, and the reason why it was already there is because of original sin. Okay, original sin, a term that gets thrown around a lot. So Nick, what is original sin? How would you define it? Uh, An original sin consists of the guilt of Adam's first sin. That's where most people get confused. We're not talking about the first sin ever committed. Adam was created upright, and he lost that due to his sin. By his sin, his whole nature was corrupted. His corrupted nature naturally produces our sinful acts. 
This is the fallen state that man is in, the inheritance of our first father, Adam. To illustrate, there's a sister in our church who was born with HIV because her mother and father had it, and therefore she inherited the virus through no act of her own. As the canon of Dort states, man after the fall begat children in his own likeness. A corrupt stock produced a corrupt offspring. So think back to Genesis 1. God creates man in his own image. But if we jump forward to Genesis 5, we see something interesting. Adam lived 130 years and became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Meaning fallen Adam is bringing forth a fallen stock. We inherited our fallen state from Adam and are by nature children of wrath. So as it's been often said, we're not sinners because we sin, but we sin because we're sinners. We sin because we're sinners. I couldn't agree more. I know I sin because I'm a sinner, and I know you sin because you're a sinner. So where did original sin stem from? So in Genesis chapter 2, we find what's been termed the covenant of works. And I think chapter 6 of the 1689 of the fall of man says it best, where it speaks about God creating man upright and perfect, giving him a righteous law. God threatens death upon violation, which implies reward upon obedience. This constitutes the covenant of works between God and man. It goes on to say that Adam did not long abide in this honor. What honor? Well, chapter 7 of the Confession says that the distance between God and man is so great that relationship with God was not possible without a voluntary condescension on his part. We know Adam was seduced and willingly ate the fruit, choosing man over God in the process. Adam's transgression resulted in condemnation to all men because he was our representative head. But Adam and Eve didn't die physically, Nick, after they sinned. Right. There was spiritual death that occurred right away. So punishment did occur as soon as Adam ate the fruit. And how do we know that? Just look. Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they hid from an omnipresent God behind a tree that God created. That sounds like spiritual death to me because to hide from a God that sees everything makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, Phil, that makes no sense. Spiritual death can clearly be seen in the first murder that occurs in Genesis 4. In Genesis 3, we have the first sin. Then later, we have the first argument between Cain and Abel, which leads to the first murder. So where did the first murder come from? The point is the first murder came out of the heart of Cain. Instead of being Abel's keeper, Cain kills his brother before the first murder. God warns Cain about sin, saying, sin is crouching at your door. So God personified sin like a beast crouching. Picture a lion crouching in the weeds, lusting to pounce on its victim. Yes, God perfectly describes the effect of original sin in this exchange. Because the sin of Adam is crouching and waiting to devour him, and in turn is waiting to devour us as well. Jesus said in Mark 7, 20-21, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. Far from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder. That is what defiles a person. So God is telling Cain that sin is within himself, crouching at the door. This is clearly meaning that sin originates inside of him. So by murdering Abel, Cain acted out what was within himself. If it wasn't originally inside of Cain, how did it get in there? Well, listen to what James says in chapter 1. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is Lord and enticed, listen to this, by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So think of it like this. The temptation is within to do sin, and you have two choices, either abort that or give birth to it. If you give birth to it, you've just given birth to sin. And so when Cain rose up to kill his brother, he didn't abort that thought. He gave into it. And his brother was murdered. And just think about in Genesis chapter 6, God saw that every intention of the heart was only evil continuously. That's all the time. And then he drowned all of humanity except for eight people because sin was in the heart. Yeah, Phil. And in Genesis 8.21, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. 
He is saying that from childhood, from what secular man would call a time of innocence, the intentions of a man's heart is evil. That is an indisputable statement, in my opinion. We didn't make this up. The doctrine of original sin is derived from a clear reading of Scripture. More on Pelagianism coming up next on Stop and Think About It. You're listening to Stop and Think About It, a podcast for the Christian thinker. If you would like to contact us, please email us at stopandthinkcrew at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.stopandthinkpodcast.com. Thank you for listening to Stop and Think About It. Welcome back to Stop and Think About It. We are discussing Pelagianism, the self-help gospel. So Steve, who are some of the major players who fought this battle over original sin and free will throughout church history. The first battle comes in the 5th century between two men. Was this the rumble in the jungle? <laughs> no, that was uh, Foreman and Ali. This is between Pelagius and Augustine. Who was Pelagius? Well, Pelagius was a 5th century Irish monk who took issue with a prayer found in Augustine's confession. That prayer said this, Lord, command what you will, and then will what you command. In other words, Lord, tell me what to do, then give me the grace to do it. So Pelagius denied that we need grace? Well, yeah, he did. How can that be? And what else did Pelagius deny? Well, Pelagius denied original sin. He believed that we are born tabula rasa, meaning blank slate. He believed that we are all born morally neutral, neither sinful nor saintful, if you will. Pelagius also denied imputed sin. He denied the federal headship of Adam. He rejected the idea that Adam's sin was imputed to his posterity and that man was born a sinner. He believed that Adam was simply an example. Pelagius also denied imputed righteousness. By denying the imputation of Adam's sin, by default, he also denied the imputation of Christ's righteousness. I'm denying Pelagius by saying 2 Corinthians 5.21, which clearly states, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen, exactly. And Pelagius also affirmed free will. Since we're born sinless, he believed that our will was not affected by the fall, and therefore it is not in bondage to our sinful nature. Since we don't have a sinful nature, thus man has free will. Oh, boy. Yeah, and Pelagius also held to an unbiblical view of grace, and I think he was a huge problem as well. He believed that God's grace was given in four elements, the grace of creation and of life, the grace of free will, the ability to sin or not to sin, the grace of God's law contained in commandments and instructions, and the grace of Jesus as our godly example. I don't know about all those Bible verses that he's twisting up there well, to come up with all this. Yeah, he doesn't have any. So this is where Augustine steps in. It was Augustine's writings and leadership that led to the condemnation of Pelagius and his followers at the Council of Carthage in 418. The council condemned Pelagius and his followers as heretics and affirmed the following. Number one, the doctrine of original sin, and number two, the necessity of grace in both salvation and sanctification. The council stood on the side of Scripture, which clearly affirms that man is unable to love, choose, or respond to God apart from God's enabling grace, and man was also unable to live a holy life apart from that same grace. It was also condemned in the Council of Ephesus in 431, and then again in the Council of Orange in 529. And it was at the Council of Orange that it took on a new form. This form was called semi-Plagianism. So it no longer denied original sin, yet it affirmed that man could make the first move towards God, and only then God would respond with saving grace. And although Plagianism and semi-Plagianism were both condemned repeatedly throughout history, The teachings still live on today. So we find the next great battle coming approximately 1,100 years later during the Protestant Reformation. Was this the thriller in Manila? No, that was Ali and Frazier. This is Erasmus and Luther. So now we have Erasmus and Luther. They fought on the bondage and the freedom of the will. Desiderius Erasmus was a humanist who wrote a polemic against Luther's teaching entitled The Freedom of the Will, where he defended the semi-Plagian view of free will. Erasmus affirmed 
original sin, but he denied that original sin totally ruined man's ability to freely choose. In other words, he believed that the human will was sick, not dead. Therefore, Erasmus held to a synergistic view of salvation, whereby man and God cooperate together in salvation. It's a joint effort. Man does his part, and God does his part. So Luther responds a year later at the prodding of his wife, Katie, and he writes The Bondage of the Will. You see, men, sometimes we ought to listen to our wives. Yes, we should. And so Luther declares the following. Man is morally responsible, but not morally able. Man isn't born spiritually sick, but spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, 1 says, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. Notice it does not say we were sick, but we were dead. We're not sick. We're not drowning in the ocean, looking for someone to throw a life preserver so that we can grab on and be saved. Instead, we're dead, lying in the bottom of the ocean, and we need someone to dive in, pull us out, and breathe life into our lungs. We need resurrection, not rescue. Salvation. Yes. So we don't really do anything. Not really. We bring our sin to the table. That's about it. And so Luther continues, man isn't free, but born as a slave, and his will is a slave to his sinful nature. Luther, like Augustine and like the Bible, denied the Pelagian concept, free will. Man was born with original sin and therefore can never will a single motive towards God apart from divine grace. But unfortunately, the battle didn't end there. The next big battle came about a hundred years later. And for that, we'll go to Nick. So basically, we have Jacob Arminius, who was semi-Pelagian, and after he died about a year later, his followers put together five articles or doctrines and presented it to the state of Holland in the form of a remonstrance. They wanted their doctrine to reflect a semi-Pelagian view. Basically, what the Arminians taught was that man is corrupt, but there is still this glimmer of power he can muster up to believe in the gospel when presented to him. Man has the power to reject the gospel if inwardly called, and God elects those he foresees coming to him in the future. Christ's death did not ensure the salvation of anyone. Repentance and faith is not a gift from God. Christ's work only makes salvation a possibility for those who would choose to believe. Believers have to maintain their faith with the danger of falling away and losing their salvation. So next, historically, we have to look to Wesley and Whitfield. You see, during the First Great Awakening, John Wesley and George Whitfield were co-laborers in preaching, but they locked horns over the doctrine of predestination. Wesley sided with the semi-Pelagians and Whitfield sided with the Reformers. Looking at Luther and Erasmus once again, realize the debate centered around the issue of man's will. Did fallen man retain free will or was his free will in bondage to his fallen nature? Is God sovereign or is man ultimately in control when it comes to the issue of salvation? Luther said to Erasmus, you of all my opponents have put your finger upon this matter. What was that matter? It was the Protestant Reformation. But yet it seems that the lines between Rome and Protestants were very clear cut during the Reformation. But today those lines are extremely blurred. Let me give you an illustration called The Little Boy and the Rattlesnake, which is a Cherokee legend. Oftentimes, young boys were sent from a village in search of a vision, and this was the case of a little native boy. He went to the top of a mountain in search of a vision. As he climbed up the mountain, the air got cooler and cooler. He found a rattlesnake lying on the path. The rattlesnake was shivering, and he said to the boy, please help me. I can't move. I'm so old and I'm so cold. I can no longer make it down the mountain any further. The boy said, no way, you're a snake. If I pick you up, you'll bite me. The snake said, no, I won't, I promise. I won't bite you if you pick me up and help me get down the mountain. So the boy picks up the snake, puts him under his shirt, goes down the mountain in search of his vision. When he got back to the bottom, he reached out, took up the snake, and the snake bit the young boy. The little boy cried and threw the snake on the ground. Mr. Snake, why did you do that? Now I'm going to die. The rattlesnake looked up and grinned at him and said, you knew I was a snake when you picked me up. You see, the moral of the story is really clear. The snake bit the boy because it acted according to its nature and everything acts according to its nature. And what is the nature of man? The nature of man is sinful. Just as a snake acted in concert with its nature, so we too act in light of our nature. Glenn, when we talk about the doctrine of free will, 
what is the doctrine of free will, and why do so many Christians preach that we have free will? I don't know, Phil, because basically God is the only one that has absolute free will. This argument is so convoluted and means so many different things to so many different people. Free will at its core is the ability to make choices without external persuasion or influence. Our God is the only one that can truly do that. Why? Because God does not have to answer to any outside authority or external pressure. People clearly do not have that kind of free will. So, guys, what are some of the arguments that promote free will? One of them I've heard was God didn't create robots. He wants us to freely love him back as he loves us. God wants us to choose him, but are we able? Romans 3 says there is no one that seeks after God. No, not one. I agree. We can never choose him. We don't have the ability to. But a second argument is this. Tell me if you've ever heard of this one. God looks down the corridors of time. It's kind of like knowing the score of a game that was recorded on your DVR and someone told you the score. And even though you're watching the game, you still know the outcome. Yes. So basically, if that argument that God looked down the corridors of time and saw Phil Sessa. And so based on Phil's decision... God predestined him. And that's exactly what I think Luther was saying and what you were saying. So you're saying that God had to learn something that he doesn't already know by looking down the corridors of time. And every time I bring that up with someone who uses that argument, very quickly they say, oh yeah, I don't want to say that. So that would mean God is not all-knowing. He's not omniscient. So isn't to foreknow to know ahead? No, sir. It's to forelove. As when Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. Romans 8.29 means that God foreloved certain people and predestined them. He chose them. They did not choose him. Here's another argument. Tell me if you heard this one. God is a gentleman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he would never force his will on anyone. Really? Why don't you ask the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, when Jesus showed up and knocked him to the ground and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Absolutely. We don't see any conversation where Jesus said, hey, Saul, would you accept me into your heart and let me be your Lord? He said, get up and go for I will show you what you must do. And not only does he knock Saul down, but when God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh, Jonah says no. He gets on a ship. God tosses him into the ocean through the hands of the men on the ship, and he sends a giant fish to swallow him up and vomit him on the shore. Not very gentleman-like, is it? Not at all. Well, listen to this. In John chapter 6, verse 43 and 44, I Jesus says this. this. Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Doesn't that mean to like woo like a man kind of woos a woman? No, listen, the word draws is the same word that James uses in James 2, 6, when he says that they drag you into court. But yet God doesn't drag people kicking and screaming into the kingdom. Instead, he overrides their will and changes their heart. He makes the unwilling, rebellious heart willing, and he doesn't ask permission. So we quote this verse all the time, Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And think about it. If we believe that Jesus is a gentleman, then how can we pray for our unsaved loved ones? Because we're literally praying that Jesus would do what we say he cannot do and change their hearts. Phil, what about John 3 when Jesus asserts that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we have to be born again? Remember, Nicodemus asked, how can one be born again? Do we re-enter our mother's womb? It may seem like a silly question, but it gets to the heart of the matter. We cannot regenerate ourselves in the same way that we cannot cause ourselves to be born again. I don't like to use the word forced, but it's definitely not something we can do or aid in any way. It's fully a miraculous work of God. More on Pelagianism coming up next on Stop and Think About It. You're listening to Stop and think about it a podcast for the christian thinker well how are you doing with growing up in every way into him who is the head into christ ephesians 4 15 what stage do you find yourself at your spiritual maturity 
If you want a resource to help you grow in your walk with Christ and be nurtured in discipleship, then look no further and check out our discipleship workbook called Multiplying for the Master. You can go through this individually or use it to disciple another believer. Visit www.soulfishingministries.org to purchase this and additional resources. Welcome back to Stop and Think About It, where we're continuing to talk about Pelagianism, the self-help gospel. Well, in our final segment, let's talk about the so what. So in order to bring everything up to speed today, we have to look to a man named Charles Finney. Well, he was a revivalist preacher during the Second Great Awakening, and he employed the method of the altar call, encouraging people to make a decision for Christ. He used many different revival techniques, including the anxious bench, and his emotional preaching sounded completely different than Edwards and Whitfield. So what did Charles Finney believe? Well, actually, a better question is, what did Charles Finney deny? Good question. Well, the first thing is, he denied original sin. Secondly, he denied penal substitution. And thirdly, he denied justification by grace alone. So, Phil, what is penal substitution? Well, penal substitution is when Christ went to the cross and he was our substitute Instead of God condemning us and pouring his wrath out upon us, he poured his wrath out upon his son in our place. Finney appears to be a full-blown Pelagian. Listen to the following quotes from Finney's systematic theology. One, he denies the doctrine of original sin. He says, The doctrine of original sin or of a sinful constitution and a necessary sinful actions represents the whole moral government of God, the plan of salvation by Christ, and indeed every doctrine of the gospel as a mere farce. Second, he denied the imputed righteousness of Christ. He says, The doctrine of an imputed righteousness, or that Christ's obedience to the law was accounted as our obedience, is founded on a most false and nonsensical assumption. Wow. Yeah. Wow. A lot of his methodologies end up sounding like a famous evangelist that we all know by the name of Billy Graham. No, not Billy. Yes, Billy. During his mass crusades, he perfected the art of the invitation system known as the altar call and the famous words called the sinner's prayer. That's like the main method people use nowadays. Well, yeah. So what it is is this. So we believe that it's the gospel that convicts the soul of sin, right? It's the preaching of the word of God. But so Finney believed that he could manipulate that will since man had free will and he could use methods, right, to manipulate someone to make a decision for Christ. So we see that today in a lot of churches. What we see are altar calls. And at these altar calls, what we have is men who begin to make an appeal to the will of man. And they do so by dimming the lights and then they have soft music, right? And now they begin to make an appeal, an emotional appeal. Sometimes they use an emotional story. And look, we're very emotional people as human beings. And so these pastors, they kind of manipulate people by using these altar calls to make a decision. The dim lights, the soft music, the emotional story to make an appeal. And sometimes these altar calls last 15 to 20 minutes. We're still waiting. There's one more person there. Just come forward. This might be your last day. And so they're appealing to the human emotion. And people are very emotional and people do respond. And sometimes these altar calls will have a few hundred people coming forward. But I think Billy Graham even acknowledged towards the end of his ministry that many of these conversions were not true conversions. Yeah. And my wife was one of them. She went to a Billy Graham crusade, thought she got saved, was not saved. She was a false convert. And Charles Finney also, uh, B.B. Warfield states that Charles Finney said at, towards the end of his ministry that the majority of people that came forward to make a p- p- profession for Christ are unworthy to be called by the name of Christ. So I got a question. So, Nick, isn't calling people to make a decision for Christ by repeating a sinner's prayer a good thing? No, it's not. Why not? It could be a total lack of sincerity. I could talk you into it. For for example, and to say in this repeat this after me type of prayer and Jesus has this wonderful plan for your life, you know, and then you you sign on. Hey, I'll try Jesus. That's the aspect. That's the mindset that you get. You know? He's like he's like a cologne. Right. You try Jesus. Yeah, right? I'll, if you I'll don't like it. him, you switch. Yeah. So, Glenn, I got a question for you. Do we see this practice anywhere in the New Testament church or the early church? Um, not in my Bible. Not in I your mean, Bible. I've read cover to cover, and I don't see that. I think another thing, too, is 
I know a lot of people right now who are Christians who seem to be getting saved every three or four times a month. And I remember when I was in church, I would feel so convicted in my heart, not convicted from a spiritual sense, but just like, hey, I need to get saved again. I need to get saved again. And it's this idea of being saved every week as opposed to this one for all salvation that the Bible talks about. I was in a denomination. I even went to a Bible college. I remember asking my theology professor, I said, why are the same people going back and forth getting saved every other week? I said, I don't know. This seems like yo-yo Christianity. I said, when does it stick? I said, because when I came to Christ, like I never walked away. Yes, I've sinned. You know, I've sinned today, I'm sure. Or if not, I will. But I haven't lost my salvation. So when does it really stick? But see, that's the problem. Because Finney taught that when a Christian sinned, he was under condemnation. Meaning Ooh. that he would he lost his salvation, wow. and if he died, he would go to hell. So he had to repent and like get saved again. Eternal insecurity, exactly. And we and we believe the Bible teaches that eternal security. That doesn't mean that you can live any way you want and go to heaven. No license no, to sin. We believe in the perseverance of the saints. Yes. Meaning that if you're truly a Christian, you will persevere in righteousness to the end, although not perfect. Nevertheless, you will persevere. Right. There's no license to sin. Paul dealt with that in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, because here is the the, the would-be sucker punch that many people give to this theology and say, well, if you can never lose your salvation, then you have a license to sin. No, what did Paul say in Romans 6, 1? What shall we say? Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? By no means. Well, uh, yeah. Phil and Steve, another thing is, it doesn't even end there, right? That's how we get all these secret sensitive churches, this this me, the mega churches where we're, we're we're appealing to them for salvation. We're also appealing to them in how we structure the church and what we can and can't do. You just said something. Seeker sensitive churches. What's the problem with seeker sensitive? There is none that seek God, no, not one. Exactly. That's what Paul said. There are none who seek God, no, not one. So why would we even want to uh, uh, structure our church as a seeker sensitive church? And that's the problem. See, a lot of the churches today say that the church and its role and purpose is to win souls. But that's not the role and purpose of the church. That's a function of the church. The church is for the saint, not the sinner. The church is where we come as the body of Christ and come together and we hear the preaching of the word, the sacraments, right? And so a lot of these churches are making church out to be for the sinner. And what they're doing is they're losing the saints. The saints are starving to death because they're not getting fed because everything in the church is aimed at the world to attract them to come in. So I think that seeker sensitive might not be so bad if you only realize that the only one seeking is God. He came and sent the son to seek and save that which is lost. He's the seeker because we're lost. He has to seek us out because because we have original sin, we would never seek him. Nick, would you have ever sought Christ? No. <laughs> Definitely not. Is, is, that, is anyone even familiar with the phrase, come as you are? I think they've missed the second part, which is come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Exactly. Yes, exactly. absolutely. And so we believe that God regenerates the heart. He changes the heart from within. He changes our will. He changes the willer so that we can respond to Christ. You see, many people think that... We can just take our free will and turn to Christ, whereas biblically, he has to change our will, make us born again on the inside, regenerate our hearts, and then we could respond to him. So remember Lazarus in the tomb? Jesus first had to make him alive and then say, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus could have never come out of the tomb in and of himself. So decisional regeneration is if I just use my free will and make a decision for Christ, now I'm born again. So I make the decision. Yes. And then God responds with salvation. That's so what they th teach. So then I actually did something to merit salvation. I actually exerted my free will. Yes. And God responded with the reward of salvation. Absolutely. I, I just don't see it in the scriptures. Glenn. I, 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 think, I, I think to wrap it into a bow, this is why we are doing a podcast like this, because it starts with this simple premise. Well, maybe we contribute something to our salvation and look at all the different heresies and all the different movements and all the different th ways that the gospel has been distorted from that one basic premise.
And yeah. we bring nothing. And that's the pride of man. We want to hold on to the fact that I contribute. I did something to earn my salvation. It's so like American individualism exactly. that we're yeah, looking at here. Yeah, we did something. We caused a sin. Exactly. <laughs> we brought we, our sin. Exactly. Look at the mess of the world. The problem's not out there. The problem's right here. Absolutely. In our hearts. You want to know what's wrong with the world? Look you in the are. mirror. <laughs> I'm looking in the mirror. I'm what's wrong with the world. You're what's wrong with the world. The I don't problem. own a mirror for that very reason. I'll buy you one. <laughs> now, check this out. Joseph stated, how can I sin against God? Now, Nick preached a message called the likely and the unlikely. And he showed that the publican beat his breast. And listen to what the publican said. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Six words. That was a sinner's prayer. No one parroted the words to him. How did he know what to say unless someone was spoon feeding him the words? Now, listen to this. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, we all believe this. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. How can you know if what you believe in your heart is what another believes in their heart, just because they parroted a sinner's prayer that you fed them. If they're just repeating words and they don't believe it, they cannot be justified. They cannot be saved from their sin. So yes, are we to call people to repentance? Absolutely. But only the Holy Spirit can lead them in this. Listen to this. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached, right? After he preached, listen to what happened. Now when they heard this, they were cut to their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So who asked the question, what should we do? The sinner. Because they were convicted. It wasn't the pastor or Peter saying, now this is what you need to do. Repeat after me. No. The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the word of God convicted their heart and they cried out and said, what shall we do? Yeah. And I think some of them need to read their Old Testament. I mean, if you go to Ezekiel 36, let me just run through it real quick. He t- it, it's all about I will. There's not a lot of anything that we contribute. He says in verse 24, I will take you away from the heathen. 25, I will sprinkle you clean. Verse 26 says, and a new heart heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. 27, I will put my spirit within you. And he continues going on, I will, I will, I will. How did it become my will, Glenn's will? I, I, I don't know. I don't know how you jump from Ezekiel 36 to these kind of decisions that they make, decisional regeneration. Yeah, you have to jump from Ezekiel 36 to John chapter 3, where Jesus said, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. And so the altar call and the sinner's prayer might be popular, but is it really biblical? I can't say that it is. And we can't justify it by being pragmatic. In other words, the end justifying the means. So if I say, I came to Christ this way, therefore it's good. We can never do that with the scriptures. We must look at the scriptures and ask, what did the people of God do? What did they preach? And how do I walk in the same practices and methodology that they employed? So many of us here are street preachers. I'm also an elder of a church. And when I preach to people, whether in the streets or in the church, I take them through God's law, point out their sin, point them to the gospel as the only way to be justified and safe from their sin. No prayer? Well, there is prayer. You see, if the Holy Spirit has convicted them of their sin, I ask them to pray a prayer of repentance. They know how to confess their own sin, just like when Nick preached, the publican said, forgive me a sinner when he beat his breast. It's not about the words. It's about the tearing of the heart because the intensity of our sin is overwhelming us. There's nowhere we can turn except to Christ. Amen. Amen. So, We went through a lot of things. We went through, we went to the garden, we went through church history, and now we're in the local church. So we touched on a whole lot of things, a whole lot of issues, and I hope you see the case that has been made and how we got to where we are now, hence ancient heresies in modern clothes. So I'm going to ask, gentlemen, any final thoughts? Well, yes, I would say this. What are we going to trust in now? Are we going to trust in the methods? 
or are we going to trust in the message? So it's the message of the gospel that's faithfully preached that saves dead sinners. So we need to get the gospel right, because if we get the gospel wrong, we get everything wrong. And the gospel is simply this. We've been talking a lot about the gospel. Well, this is the gospel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life for 33 and a half years under the law of God and perfectly fulfilled it where Adam and everyone else failed. And so now God takes his son and he punishes him in the place as a substitute in the place of guilty, hell-deserving sinners. That would be us. And so God pours out the full cup of his wrath upon his son, Jesus, and treats him as if he was the worst sinner. And by doing that, God punishes sin. And so now God can freely forgive all who would repent and trust in Christ alone for salvation. And what God does, he offers what's called the great exchange. We exchange our sin for Christ's righteousness. God doesn't simply forgive the sin, but he punishes it in his son, Christ. And so those who believe in Christ and trust in Christ alone, God imputes the perfect record and the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ to their account, and God treats them just like he treats his perfect son. And that's the gospel, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ on behalf of dead sinners. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ Believe in the gospel today, and you will be saved. So at this point, you may be asking yourself the question, so what? Why is this important? Well, like always on Stop and Think About It, we like to answer the so what. Why are these doctrinal distinctions so critical? They are important because what we believe about original sin and free will will radically impact how we respond to the gospel. The Augustinian view says that man is hopelessly dead in sin and unable to turn to God. Our free will must be viewed as being in bondage, shackled with a chain to the ball of sin. Then only those God has drawn can and will come to him in repentance and faith. However, the semi-Pelagian view says that man is merely sick and not dead, which means man can simply decide to turn to God or decide not to follow him. From Augustine to the Reformers down to the present, there has been a battle over this question, but I hope that we have proven biblically that we are ruled over by our sinful desires and incapable of choosing salvation. If you are a preacher, I encourage you, aim for repentance, not a decision when you preach. I close with two quotes. It was G.K. Chesterton who said, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people come alive. And Augustine who stated, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. For additional resources about the issues covered in this podcast, visit our website, www.stopandthinkpodcast.com. Thank you for taking this time to stop and think about it. If you would like to contact us, please email us at stopandthinkcrew at gmail.com. You could also visit our website at www.stopandthinkpodcast.com. This podcast is listener supported by generous people like you. You can give a tax deductible donation at our affiliate ministry at www.soulfishingministries.org and click on our donate link to give securely through PayPal. Thank you for listening to Stop and Think About It. 